disclosures. All right. Well, great. Thanks very much. I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, be able to share uh, some ideas about seismology education and what that might look like as we move forward into, you know, increasing the number of NGSS aligned classrooms that are out there. Um, so that'll be the main focus for today. Um, so one caveat that I like to give when I start off these sorts of sessions is to say, first, that um, I'm not a seismologist myself, uh, so there may be questions that come up at the end that I need to take a few notes on um, to help connect with the right people to kind of get answers to those questions. Um, but on the other hand, I've been working on seismology education issues, my background's in science education, uh, and I've been doing this since 2003 for the IRIS Consortium. Um, so I can field probably most of the questions, but, but we may reach those limits. And if we do, we can get answers to those questions. So uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what we mean by seismology. So seismology is the study of elastic waves and their sources. And there are two types of data that we usually collect for this. The first is going to be in the top right-hand corner. We have time series data, uh, which is going to be showing us uh, you know, seismograms, recordings of ground motion at various locations around the world. And this can be sort of, you know, continuous time, uh, time series data, you know, hours and hours to months of data. Uh, or we might be looking at just little snippets of data that happen around particular earthquakes or thing, things of interest that we want to examine. The other type of data that we might want to, um, the other thing that we might want to um, uh, pay attention to is that down here in the bottom, we have event data, and these are going to be uh, details of an actual earthquake that takes place somewhere like the date, the time, the latitude, and the longitude of that event, um, its depth, um, its magnitude, and that sort of thing. And so these are all put together in catalogs that are then used for things like uh, uh, studying and forecasting uh, earthquake hazards. Um, we're also going to be using some of these time series data for things like deeper structure studies, um, we might use them to study, you know, fault rupture mechanisms, uh, and we might use these things to study things like explosions or monitoring for the nuclear test ban treaty. These are sort of the common traditional uses of seismology. However, what's really exciting right now is that we're applying many of the uh, techniques um, um, <clears throat> for um, studying seismology, some of these uh, more traditional topics, we're applying these now to new, uh, new uh, areas of science. So one that's currently being studied is storms, for example. Uh, there's active research going on right now uh, where we're using seism seismographs around the world to um, begin to measure and better understand hurricanes and tornadoes. Uh, we're using uh, seismometers to be deployed around car systems to understand uh, groundwater flow through car systems. Um, we're using them similarly to measure bed load in fluvial systems, especially um, uh, fl during flood stage when other systems that are more traditional are unable to keep up and mo actively monitor the bed load just because of the sheer volume of, of water that's moving. Um, we're also studying glaciers with uh, seismological techniques and even using uh, seismometers to, to make estimates of, of sea ice coverage in, in certain areas um, where we might not be able to actively see them by studying the micro seisms or the waves that are crashing against uh, the, the coastline or the continental shelf, um, and we'll able to see that on seismographs. All right, so I did want to do a quick poll. Uh, now that we've got a little bit of background on the types of data that we might use, I'd like to see do a quick poll on um, how people might use this data in the classroom. So um, the first poll question that we're going to be asking about, and you should get a poll that pops up for you, um, the first poll question is going to be, um, what grade level were you primarily teaching at? Uh, the second question that I'd like to know about is ways in which you currently use seismograms as part of your instruction. And then number three, uh, ways that you currently use that seismic event data as part of your instruction. So we'll give people a few minutes to answer those. <clears throat> 
okay, great. Uh, this is really helpful for me to uh, kind of see the way in which uh, people are, are using seismic data. And I think it would be really interesting for, um, uh, for you to take a look at it as well. There's some common themes there that we might want to pay attention to. Uh, in fact, I'll touch on these as we continue on. So thank you all for, for answering that question. All right, so what we'd like to accomplish by the end of the session today is number one, I'd like you to be able to describe just a little bit about the SAGE facility. Uh, this is the um, facility that's operated by the IRIS Consortium um, and that I work, for, I work for. And we also want you to be able to find educational resources and data sources on the IRIS website. And finally, we'd like you to be able to describe at least one way that, you're, uh, that you might go forward and modernize the seismology instruction that you deliver in your own classroom. So I think the place to start is um, by just a little bit about the SAGE facility. So SAGE stands for the Seismological Facility for the Advancement of Geoscience. It's funded by the National Science Foundation as a research facility. And um, we have three main programs that we operate at, uh, at the SAGE facility. The first are instrumentation, instrumentation services. Um, and this group is responsible for the deployment and maintenance of seismic instrumentation around the world. This includes both permanently installed stations that are monitoring for um, deep earth structure studies, nuclear test ban treaty monitoring, as well as pools of uh, temporary deployment uh, instruments that might be, uh, for example, ocean bottom seismographs that are going to be deployed for short time periods and then recovered, or, or terrestrial based systems where uh, we might deploy uh, high precision or um, high frequency sensors uh, over uh, locations for you know anywhere from a period of a few days out to a couple of years, and then those are, instruments are all picked back up. We have staff to go out, service these equipment, help deploy them, um, and help make sure the experiments go smoothly. The second program that we have is the Data Services Program. This is the world's largest re repository of seismic data. Uh, we have data being streamed in from geologic surveys all around the world. Uh, this data is curated by our staff and prepared to be served back out to the community who want to use it for uh, research purposes as well as those who want to use it for education purposes as well. So all of the data that we ho hold is freely available for anybody who'd like to access it. Um, and one of the things that we work on is providing a, a variety of ways to get at that data um, that would be most appropriate for the audiences that want to reach it. And finally, the third program that I work for is the Education and Outreach Program. And here I put a variety of the uh, staff who work for the Education Outreach Program because many of the products that I'm gonna be showing in this talk um, are produced by them. And so I wanna make sure they get credit for their work. Um, I get to show it, uh, but they have uh, invested a lot of time and hours and thoughts and thought and energy into uh, creating these excellent products. So if we're going to uh, talk about modernizing our um, seismology instruction, I think it's worth talking a little bit about what traditional seismology instruction uh, would look like. So I think what you're seeing up here on the screen kind of matches what I expected from the poll. Um, you know, a common way to use event data is by uh, an epicenter plotting activity where you get a list of earthquakes and you have students plot those around, uh, around the world and begin to look for patterns in that data. The second activity, uh, often done in combination with the third one, is taking a look at some seismograms and doing a few things with those seismograms. Uh, we might locate an earthquake using the S minus P location exercise, where students pick a P, P arrival and an S arrival. They subtract um, the arrival times of those to then use a, um, a travel time curve to look at how far away that event actually is um, from, the, uh, from the epicenter. And then the final thing is calculating a Richter magnitude. And so we use uh, um, nomograms. There's an activity online on the Virtual Seismologist uh, website uh, that's quite popular where people go in and you can then measure the amplitude of the waves and then use the nomogram to look up uh, what that magnitude would be based off of how far away that event actually is. So what I'd like you to do right now, <clears throat> everyone just take a minute or so, I'll give you at least 60 seconds to do this, uh, maybe even a little bit longer. I'd like you to jot down a few ideas on scrap paper that you have sitting there. You could even type them in the chat window if you wanted. Um, but think about what you're trying to accomplish with these activities that you're using. And I'd like you to think a little bit about how they fit into the current NGSS standards. So um, it's a broad question um, and we only have a little bit of time but 
put down a few ideas about one of those aspects, either how you, how or why you use them, what you're trying to accomplish, and then uh, and or how they fit into NGSS. Okay, I've been <clears throat> monitoring the chat window and hopefully those of you, others of you have been uh, jotting down some ideas yourself um, just on some paper. But there's some, some really interesting themes that are coming out in the chat window and they're common across a lot of the responses. And I think they're important. They're dealing with the idea of uh, using scientific data with students and helping them to engage in the scientific process. And also uh, the use of real world events. You know, earthquakes are inherently exciting things to students. Um, they're sudden, they're unexpected, sometimes they're catastrophic, and so they're really attention grabbing. Um, and so that's a common theme across um, ideas about why people might be using those. So when I did a little reflection on where these fit within the N NGSS, I started by looking at the use of event data, right? This idea of pl epicenter plotting, for example, might be one activity that we would do. And one of the things that I quickly noticed was that um, the role of event data is kind of shifted downward in the NGSS. Um, you know, we see as early as in fourth grade where we're asking students to analyze and interpret data on maps um, to describe patterns or features on the Earth's surface. And this is, specifically includes earthquake data. So here we might be asking students not so much to identify plate boundaries, but we may be asking them to look at the relationship between where earthquakes take place and say the location of mountain ranges or the depth of earthquakes and uh, the depth pattern of earthquakes, uh, similar to what I show here in the Iris earthquake browser, um, and then the onshore um, mountain ranges down along the coast of South America. And from there, we can then get into in middle school, the idea of using this event data um, to have better define uh, the idea of plate tectonics, looking at plate motion and plate boundaries um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so they are well, it's well fit into the NGSS, um, although at a slightly earlier in age than maybe we have traditionally been teaching some of these concepts. It would not be uncommon for a middle school classroom or even a high school classroom to do some of these activities um, that we might be asking students to do now at an earlier age. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time taking a look at this tool, but I would encourage you to take a look at the Iris Earthquake browser as a source um, for um, getting access to event data. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side of this tool, if I can uh, mark it up, on the right hand side of this tool, uh, here you have the ability to filter the data, uh, going back to the 1960s to choose uh, the number of events that you want to display, the region of the world you want to look at, time ranges that you want to look at. And then what's nice is you can export that data uh, into various formats, whether Excel or a table format, so that you can then have your students actually work with that data and do things. So it's a useful tool. Uh, the URL is here on the screen, but it will also be in the slide deck at the end if people want it. So the next place that I wanted to look at is um, 
All right, there we go. Sorry about that. I had to uh, clear my annotations and that was uh, proving difficulty with advancing my slides. So the next thing I wanted to look at is how do seismogram activities fit into, uh, the traditional seismogram activities fit into the NGSS. And um, it turns out that as when you read through all of the standards, uh, things like earthquake location really aren't part, explicitly part of the new um, standards. Um, uh, we use earthquake locations, um, we use seismic waves, there's explicit mention of those sorts of things, but they don't really come up that explicitly within the standards. The other thing that I would note here too in terms of a, a um, discussion of modernizing your seismology instruction is that the act of using S minus P locations is a little bit dated. Um, you know, earthquakes haven't really been located in this way since um, before the 1960s. Um, and from an instructional point of view, a concern that, that I have um, is the overemphasis on the sort of crossing of the circles, right? It, the idea of a right answer um, being what you're after here, the point where they touch. And this becomes problematic for students because number one, they're commonly using or, um, compasses on flat maps. Uh, so they're trying to solve a three-dimensional problem on a two-dimensional map. Um, they don't have a ton of practice with compasses in general. Um, and the other thing too is that in order to really be able to identify both P and S waves, um, they're tough to identify in actual seismic data. So what ends up happening is um, many, many students are using synthetic seismic data or, at, or even then sometimes they're hand-drawn wiggles on a page uh, simply to show that bump one is P and bump two is S. Uh, even though it's, that's highly simplified when we start looking at seismic data. In fact, uh, if we were going to do this activity, we would actually want to use um, three component seismic data uh, that would include you know, both directions of horizontal motion as well as vertical motion um, because P is strongest generally on the, um, on the vertical component and S shows up most strongly on the horizontal components. Um, and the other concern that we have, of course, too, is with Richter magnitude calculations. Um, again, another dated technique. Uh, Richter magnitudes are no longer used. Um, they're really only applicable to California or the greater California region when they were um, first created. And they're dependent on the use of a Woods-Anderson seismograph, which is no longer produced and, and really only maintained uh, in places like the, the um, Weston Observatory at Boston College, where they're maintaining historical equipment in order for the purposes of um, comparing data over uh, many different years and many different instrumentation types. So there's a few concerns that we have with some of our more traditional seismogram activities that we use in the classroom, which makes these ripe targets for uh, doing some updating. So I'd like you to you know, take a quick pause. I'll open the chat window that I've closed because it's a little distracting for me and see if there's some questions in there that maybe we want to field. Uh, and you might want to take a minute or two and jot down some ideas about some of the things that we've been uh, been talking about. Hey, Michael, this is Aida. I've been having some conversations with a couple people here about um, Richter magnitude versus moment magnitude. And you were talking about modernizing instruction. I'm wondering how you recommend we think about those. That's a great question. Um, so um, what we encourage people to do when talking about magnitudes, because there's many different ways to calculate magnitude, even besides moment magnitude and Richter magnitude. So the answer that we usually give is, if you say magnitude, you will always be correct. If you say Richter magnitude, you will almost always be incorrect because the Richter magnitude calculation isn't used anymore uh, for the most part. And the key for seismic moment is, um, for moment magnitude is that we're calculating some of the more physical parameters of the fault rupture. So the seismic moment is, if you think about um, physical science properties, it's the length and the width and the displacement of the fault, um, how far it actually ruptured. And so that gives us what we call the seismic moment or the energy released by that, which we then scale up to the moment magnitude scale to get onto that traditional one to sort of well, technically it's infinite in either direction, but we can tend to think of earthquakes as being in a sort of zero to 10 ballpark uh, range. Um, and that's how we get there is by scaling up this seismic moment calculation. So when our students hear a news report that says the magnitude was 6.3, what are they reporting? Yeah, they're almost always reporting moment magnitude uh, now. Uh, there's a few cases where they might be using a slightly different type. 
But I think the key here is for most people, it, it really doesn't matter what type of magnitude because they're all made to scale to one another. And so it's best if they just say, we just say magnitude. Um, and you know, if they, students want to learn a little bit more, for example, uh, they might use the earthquake machine activities that we have where we have an actual fault block that slides around. And you can begin to think about the amount of energy that that block would have when it's moving as if the block were twice as big or three times as big, uh, for example would be a, a more a larger energy release which would then be um, scale up to a larger magnitude event okay um michael yes um this, this is rebecca dodge i i attended a a, a week-long iris training in austin several years ago um that was uh, provided for the um teachers who work with the uh, educational resource centers in Texas and we built the earthquake machines and I got back to my university and I built earthquake machines and did teacher training with those and if anybody on this call has never actually put one of those together you have to do it, it it's it's I just can tell you it's a wonderful experience for your for your students Thanks for that. It was it was a fun workshop. I, I do uh, remember presenting there uh, quite vividly. It was a great group of, of folks and it is a great activity. It's a really engaging activity. It gives students a chance to collect data in the classroom. Um, as part of, in, in a section of the, of the uh, geoscience unit where they traditionally might not have a chance to collect empirical data on their own. So um, if I get a second at one of the breaks, I'll try to put in a URL here. Um, to see if I can share that in the chat um, so people can get access to it. It's very effective in the classroom. Okay, so let's kind of move on here. So what could we do, oops, I'm going to get back one. So what could we actually do if we wanted to try to modernize the seismology in your NGSS classroom? Well, this might be shocking to some, but one thing we could do is drop earthquake locations. And we could replace that with a more aligned activity using seismograms. There's other things that you can actually do with students in your classroom using seismic data that is better aligned with the standards and actually um, might help them learn more important topics um, than the process of triangulation, uh, for example. So one example of what that might look like would be um, exploring the interiors of terrestrial planets. So there's a high school standard that specifically calls out looking at seismic evidence uh, to develop a model uh, for Earth's interior. And this is one of the activities that we can do very easily with seismic data with our students. And so I'm gonna walk through this activity a little bit with you here um, in this webinar. It would be a great activity to uh, um, Get, get your feet wet in the webinar and then download the materials and take a look at yourself um, because there are a number of steps in it, um, but the end product is really quite surprising for most students. And I, I think um, most people have quite a, a lot of success with it. So let's start off by asking the question, how do you personally know what's inside of the earth? And I'll tell you, when you ask this question, <laughs> when you ask this question to uh, your students, you'll get things like just showed up in the chat, like, well, I know there's dirt down there, I dug a hole. Or you might have had a student that's walked past a large construction site in an urban setting and they say, well, down there, when you get down to, there's rock down there, there's concrete down there. Uh, some may have been to a cave and they may, you know, say, well, it's definitely rocks. I've been to a cave, it's really deep and I, I've seen rocks all around me or a quarry. So we can get to this idea of, with students that they do have some direct experience with what's below the surface of the earth, um, although it will vary highly across the students um, that you might have in your classrooms. A number of them will try to answer this question by saying, well, the earth has a layered interior. And then when you press them and you say, well, how do you know that? How do you really know that? And they all suddenly begin to realize that they don't really know that. They've seen it on the Discovery Channel. They've read it in a textbook somewhere. Um, they maybe have had an instructor who's shown it to them in the past, but they really don't know how we know that. And so that's really what this activity is all about. It's about discovering and measuring Earth's layered interior. So this group is going to divide up, uh, you're going to divide your class into two groups. 
there'll be seismologists in one group and they're still gonna use seismograms. They're gonna use what we call a record section of seismograms. And uh, the record section shown here on the left has uh, time since the earthquake on the Y axis and distance from the earthquake is plotted on the X axis here. So the uh, sort of brownish seismogram is the furthest away from the event at, you know, in this case, it looks like maybe 160 degrees away from the earthquake. Um, with blue being the dark blue on the far left being the closest, it may be a few degrees away from uh, the earthquake. The other half of the class are going to be theoreticians. And this is going to, this part of the activity is really going to emphasize the science and engineering practices as, aspects of the NGSS. Um, because these, these theoreticians are going to actually develop a model that we can then compare with our observed data. And so how this works is, um, seismologists are going to look at their record section, distance away again on the x-axis, time since the earthquake on the y-axis, and they're going to go in and we're going to mark on, this, on the, each seismogram when the seismic waves first arrive. And we could even say when do the P waves arrive if we've already covered um, different types of seismic waves with our students. And they can go through and relatively quickly discern what's background noise and they can then discern when the first seismic waves arrive. And they're really gonna just record the travel time. So what time did the energy actually arrive at each station around the globe? Meanwhile, the theoreticians are going to get a scale model of the earth. So it's a piece, two pieces of eight and a half by 11 paper, uh, printed at a ridiculous, or you know, scaled down to a ridiculously small scale to fit. Uh, they're gonna tape the paper together uh, in the center is marked a uh, red dot with the center of the earth and the curve is the surface of the earth on the outside. And so like the students, you know, direct experiences, which the deepest most students will have been will be a cave or a quarry where they've seen lots of rock. So we're going to assume in our model that the velocity of a P wave is going to be 11 kilometers per second, uh, which is, you know, about the uh, velocity of P waves in rock. So all the way through, solid rock, right? The simplest solution to the problem is that it's all the same thing down there, which is what was actually thought um, uh, before we had seismic studies of the earth. So because it's a scale model, the theoreticians can use their model to predict with a velocity of 11 kilometers per second, when the seismic waves should arrive at various degrees around the earth's surface. So we have an earthquake that takes place in the lower right-hand corner of our scale model, and each triangle represents that we've drawn onto the surface represents a seismic station. And then I can just use a ruler, or in this case for some of the distant ones you need a meter stick, measure what that travel path is for that seismic energy, and then I can just simply do a series of conversions to get from the length of the travel path to a time uh, by using velocity, uh, to predict when the seismic waves should arrive at various distances around the Earth. So now you have half the class with observed data, and half the class has now generated model data for when those should arrive with our assumptions of 11 kilometers per hour. If you wanted to be creative, you could allow a few groups to uh, vary the velocities of their model. So maybe you want to have somebody assume the Earth is solid gold. If you get online, you can Google a P-wave velocity in gold or other metals, um, other materials, um, just to add some interest to some of the groups and you could make comparisons. So then at the end of the day, uh, we want to have the two groups bring their data together and they can plot those up on an Excel plot. They can graph them by hand or if you're short on time, you can just simply create one plot for the entire class in the front of the room. Um, but here on the screen, you'll see observed data plotted in blue and uh, model data will be plotted in red. So the question I always ask students is how well does it fit? And not surprisingly, um, students who haven't looked at a lot of data uh, frequently will start off by saying, well, it's great, it's pretty good. Um, but then if you push them a little bit more, they'll say, well, I say, is it all good? And they say, well, not, not all good. There's, there's some places where it doesn't fit real well. And I say, okay, great. So tell me a little bit about that. Why do you think that might be? What's going on there? And where does that take place? That's another important piece. And so most students can see pretty clearly that um, between the, um, that the last three uh, bits of observed data don't line up very well with the model data, that we have some discrepancy happening you know, beyond 100 degrees, but not to, you know, maybe 115, 118 degrees, somewhere in between there, 
something happens or goes wrong with the, the model and the, and the observed data. And so we want to find out what that could be. Um, so the next step of this activity, now that we've established that uh, the homogeneous model doesn't match our data, is to say, well, what could be going on inside of there? And so we give them a second scale model and a protractor, and we have them say, all right, well, let's assume about 108 degrees uh, away, uh, everything worked up to 108 degrees away. And so I'll try to mark this up again. That would be this section out here and this section down here. That all worked uh, really well. However, out here, uh, beyond 108 degrees away, we had problems where our, our data just didn't match up. So I asked them to cut away the part that worked, leaving only behind the part that, um, that didn't work. And so they end up with a, um, again, same. There we go. So then we end up with a shape that looks something like this. So they've cut out this sort of ice cream cone shape. And then I asked them, okay, lay that ice cream cone shape on top of another model. So the ice cream cone shape that you see here is actually sitting on top of another scale model circle. And I asked them to trace the edges of these lines. And so the earthquake happens at the red dot, everything you know, in, out to 108 degrees works, beyond 108 degrees doesn't work. And then I asked them, okay, now rotate it. So you have had two earthquakes on opposite sides of the earth, and then a third earthquake, and a fourth earthquake. And you keep just rotating this. And as you keep rotating this around on the paper and you keep tracing out that 108 degree, 108 degree line, set of lines, you begin to define some object that is in the way or causing a problem between our observed data and our model data. And it turns out that if you spend a little bit of time and you um, measure the dimensions of this object on your scale model, you can calculate the core of the earth within a few degrees of error um, with your students. So they've used paper and pencil on a ridiculously small scale model, um, but they really get an accurate um, idea of uh, the size of the core inside of the earth. And they've discovered it with seismic data. So it's a pretty cool finding um, that they end up with. So where do you go from here? Well, now that you've established that we have to have a core in there, we could spend a little bit of time um, exploring some of those ideas about what's going on inside of the Earth. So I did want to take a moment and showcase um, uh, an animation that we put together. We have a whole suite of about 130 different animations um, supporting seismological topics. Um, this happens to be one about a brief history of how we found out what's inside the Earth. I'll show a minute or two of this just to give you a sense of um, what our animations are like, um, and also to give you a little bit of background about that activity that we just completed. Much of our knowledge of Earth's insides comes from monitoring the thousands of earthquakes that occur every year. Five centuries ago, the world had mostly accepted that the Earth was not only a sphere, but was thought to be of uniform rock throughout. 200 years later, Sir Isaac Newton, studying our planetary system, calculated that the interior of the Earth must be made of far denser material than the surface rock. Newton's estimate of the overall density of the Earth remains essentially unchanged today. In the early 1900s, scientists discovered they could use data from earthquakes as a method for looking deep beneath the surface. By understanding the travel times of different seismic waves to worldwide stations, scientists were able to calculate where boundaries occurred and what those boundaries represented. They thus determined that the Earth has three layers based on chemical composition, crust, mantle, and core. As an analogy for relative scale, these layers can be compared to an egg. With so I'm going to uh, stop the animation there. Um, but as you can see, uh, we basically you know, performed what Richard Oldham had done in 1906, and we used data from a recent earthquake um, that we were able to pull down. In fact, you can pull from the most recent earthquake. So you could use the, um, the recent Caribbean earthquake um, we also had a, a seven point something that happened uh, just off the northeast coast of Japan um, within the last 24 hours. Uh, you could use data from that earthquake to discover the core of the earth. 
Um, it's all available to you through the activity. Um, you go into a special uh, URL to get that data and the data comes pre-formatted to be able to use in the activity as a record section. So it's really easy to use. The other tool that I would just quickly, whoops, I wanna just quickly mention is um, this uh, seismic um, waves tool. So it's in your web browser and it allows you to investigate how waves propagate into the uh, core in a variety of different levels of detail. So you can have the most detailed version where you look at phases like the PKIKP, um, where it's going into the core and coming back out of the core, where you can see reflections and refractions, or if you choose to change um, the labels on it, you can simplify this way down uh, to really just show the direct P and S arrivals uh, that you might talk about. But it's a nice combination of the seismic uh, recordings on the left-hand side of the screen uh, with stations uh, shown on the surface and the actual um, waveforms propagating through the earth and arriving at each station. So at this point, I'd like to take another brief pause um, to allow people to jot down some notes, maybe ask a question or two, if anybody has questions at this point. Um, or if not, just a few ideas for processing, maybe some ideas that you now have. Hey, Michael, Aida again, one of the conversations I'm having here with a couple of people is about um, the data that you use to get to the 108 degrees. So it's it's one event with data's, data points from many different locations that felt that event. Uh, that's right. So let me go back to that uh, slide. So we're looking at one event and each one of these triangles is a different station around the world recording that exact same event. And so you can see that there is a delay as the waves travel around the earth and through the earth um, to reaching each one of those uh, stations. And so just thinking that it would be interesting to maybe have different classes look at different events and then compare across classes, but lots of different permutations you could come up with to build that, out a bigger data set there. To that's right, that's right. Yeah. So kind of you know, what we had done here uh, towards the end where we were rotating this model around on top, we were having earthquakes take place at different locations. You could start off by having um, you know, different seismologist groups. Groups of three work pretty well for that activity. So different groups of three being seismologists could have a different event um, to use to start with, which would then be similar to what you're having them do here at the end where they're actually turning that, that piece of the model. Okay, for the sake of time, let's, let's kind of move on. So if you really want to get modern with your seismology instruction, you, you could extrapolate this out to another one of the high school standards uh, where we're talking about collecting and using scientific reasoning and evidence from ancient earth materials, meteorites, other planets um, to account for earth's formation in early history. Right, so how do terrestrial planets form? Well, we know that the planet starts through the process of accretion and um, bringing material together. Uh, we also know then that it heats up, the interior begins to melt. Um, step three is stuff happens. It's really not that well understood, certainly for planets, uh, other terrestrial planets in the solar system. But at the end of the day, we end up with a crust, a mantle, and a core. And so one of the ways that we're currently studying this is with the InSight mission. So NASA landed a uh, lander on Mars that you've probably heard about, the InSight mission, where they deployed a seismometer. And that data is now coming back and being streamed into the Iris Data Management Center, and you can get access to this data in your classroom. Now, right now, there isn't enough data to be able to actually um, determine the interior structure of Mars, but that is an active science project that they're working on. In fact, at the last AGU meeting just a few months ago in December, um, the first results were being shared about um, identifying the you know, number of meteorite impacts, the number of Mars quakes that they're experiencing on Mars surface. And so that data is available for you to see uh, 24 hours a day uh, with a delay. There's a time delay in that when that data comes back from Mars. Uh, but you could see it in near real time as it comes in, uh, in your own classroom. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So that would be a really modern update uh, to your classroom. So the second option that I thought about was, well, there's gonna be some people who do not want to abandon the earthquake location. And so for those people, I would say, that's fine. 
Um, it probably would fit into the middle school level then where we're talking a lot about um, using the location of earthquakes um, uh, to define plate boundaries. So an obvious question for students might be, well, how do they know where these earthquakes happen if they happen in remote Alaska um, or somewhere in the South Pacific where people don't really live? So we could talk a little bit about seismom seismometers and how they work. And then we could talk about how we actually locate earthquakes. So here is an alternative to the S minus P location. So on the left, I have a map. Uh, you can see that, uh, I hate to do it, but I'll drag out the drawing tools again. Uh, this is Japan right here. Every one of these red triangles is a uh, seismic station. And so on the right side, we now have, again, one of those record sections, only it's plotted in the reverse axes. So time is now going on the x-axis with time since the event, a zero time or when the event took place on the left, and then time since the event going out to the right. And then the number of degrees away each station is from the event is on the uh, y-axis on this plot. So clearly, when I look at my seismic recordings, I can say an event happened somewhere but where? I don't know where. So how might you begin this? Take a moment and think about how you might start to tackle this problem. So one of the ways that you might tackle this problem is by using an approach called the bisector method. So the bisector method says, okay, we're going to actually start by comparing two stations, and we're going to use a process of elimination to find out where this earthquake probably happened in the world. So I'm going to compare these two stations here, and I'm going to connect these two stations with a, with a path. And in the middle of the path, halfway in between the two stations, I'm going to draw a line we're going to call a bisector. And the idea here is that we want to compare which one of these stations had the seismic waves arrive to it first. And if we know which, ha which, side it, uh, which station it arrived to first, we can tell which side of this bisector line the earthquake had to have been on. So we're going to compare Tato and Wake, and we're going to decide which half of the map the earthquake has to be on. So use the chat box. Which station was closest to the epicenter? Tato or Wake? Yep, I'm seeing some votes for Tato start to come in. And you're right. So Tato, the seismic energy arrived there first. Uh, and so we know that Tato has to be closer to the earthquake than Wake is. And so if we go back to our map, that means that everything on the Wake side of the line can be shaded out. And if we shade that area out, we know the earthquake can't be anywhere in that section. And so we then go through a process of elimination and we create pairs between all the other stations that are on the, on the page. And what you end up with is a solution that looks like this. So this was an, uh, I had shaded out this entire activity. Um, and you end up with a small triangle near um, one of the stations where the earthquake had to have been. And you might have been able to come up with, I can't guarantee I did all the pairs there when working on this, but I did most of the pairs and I got it down to this very small area. So you do have to have pretty good station coverage, a fair number of stations around the event to use this location. Um, but if you do use this, P waves are much easier to pick than S waves are. In fact, a lot of times S waves don't show up very well if you're only looking at one seismogram as opposed to, like I said before, three seismograms. Um, this process of using P waves only is much closer to how we actually locate earthquakes, and so we're modeling that basic idea. Right now, we don't have an automated way to do this, but within the next few months, we're working on developing this tool. So we will have an auto online uh, bisector location activity uh, for students to be able to do on the screen. And so it gives a new way for us to locate earthquakes. Again, this still isn't quite how we do it, but it's closer than the S minus P method. So I'll take a couple of questions since I introduced a new idea for some of you.
Okay, Aida again. Um, one, one of the thoughts was that in thinking about that more traditional or structure activity, there are also, as you noted, some other uses for seismic data, like looking at um, riverbed load. So are there activities for any of those kind of non-traditional classroom type activities available online on IRIS's site? There are. Found? So uh, there are for some. I will show you, um, I will show you a couple at the very end of the talk um, as well. So I will show you a couple, and some of them are really new and we don't have anything. Bed load is one we don't have anything yet, uh, but it would one that we would love to. Great, thanks. Uh, somebody is asking if we can provide a source for how the epicenter is really determined. So let's go on. So a better approach, there would be a better approach, and this is the way that we'll, we'll talk about how we actually are gonna locate earthquakes. So if I gave you this same setup, now having seen the bisector, what might you assume right away? So if I gave you this data and this set of stations, what would be a back of the envelope calculation for where the earthquake is? Right, so the, the, the most obvious place to start, somebody just posted into the chat box is, well, it's gotta be close to this station, right? This station um, is pretty close to the epicenter, not a lot of time between when the event happened and when the seismic waves arrived. And we did find that when we used the bisector method. So you might just start about, um, start about that point. Uh, so the way we're going to actually solve this inverse problem is we're going to say, let's make an initial estimate of where that earthquake is. And we're gonna assume that, that it's the closest station to the epicenter. We're then going to use a velocity model to predict P wave arrivals for that location. So based, think about the velocity model that we used in our earth structure activity. We assumed 11 kilometers per second. Same basic idea. We're gonna use a computer and we're gonna predict when the seismic energy should arrive at all of those stations if the source of that energy was that closest station. And when we compare the predicted values to the actual values, we're gonna get an error. And if that error is acceptable, we're going to tell the computer to stop, stop running. And uh, that's the location. However, if the error is unacceptable, we're gonna tell the computer to adjust its location in some using some parameters and then repeat it. So move it in a direction that gives you, that's likely to give you a lower error and repeat the process. And it will continue to run this loop of trying a solution, predicting the values, comparing the predicted values to the observed values and seeing how close the error is. And it'll continue to run this loop until we reach some sort of acceptable level of error. And that's how we actually locate earthquakes using only P waves. So this is the modern process, uh, the really modern process that you might wanna consider using with your students. So to be able to actualize this, we are developing a tool called EQ Locate, and it's in beta, mo uh, beta mode right now. So we, it works, it's available online, um, but we haven't publicly released it yet because we're still kind of tweaking it. But I'll give you a quick walkthrough of it. So we get a set of stations, and we collect seismograms for those stations um, that you uh, might use. And I'm gonna share my, I'm gonna share my web browser. So I've gone in and I've picked out some stations that I wanna pick seismograms at. And I'm going to say, where did the energy first arrive? Because the time of arrival of the actual waves is really important. So I'm gonna go through all of these and I'm gonna pick locations or pick times on the seismogram when I think the seismic energy got there and I'm going really fast for the sake of this webinar. And then once I've done that, I'm gonna go up here to next. And so what I get is I get error bars shown and it's called, this RMS error is shown here. And as I move, my uh, location around. So instead of having the computer picking new, new locations over and over and over again, I'm actually going to begin to move that around 
And as I do, you see that the error changes. So if I go really far away, I get some really big arrows that are showing me really large error, amounts of error. And we can see error in the lower right-hand corner as well. However, if I begin to get into the ballpark of where the event is, you can see I get to a green level of error uh, where I have an acceptable value and we would call that the location um, of the actual event. So that's how we actually are locating earthquakes. Um, and just for the sake of time, we ask for a couple of examples um, in my slide deck or how you can get to Mars data. But I did because the question came up. Here's an example of where we could work towards using non-traditional performance expectations. So we could ask what's shaking in, in Greenland here, uh, where we have the number of ice quakes that are happy um, uh, are happening in any given year uh, in Greenland, and we can see a pattern happening. And so you might ask your students, why do they think this is happening? What do they already know about glaciers? Because here's the locations of these events. You'll notice they're all on the edges of the glacier. Your students might guess that it has something to do with temperature. So if I re-bin that data, I can bin that data so that it's by month, but all the years combined and we see a pattern, sure enough, in the warmest months, the number of uh, events increase. So then we can take that data and we could address these high school standards um, by looking at issues of climate change by comparing air temperature to the number of ice quakes that are taking place. And so we could talk about flows of energy into and the interactions between various systems um, that we're measuring. So ground motion caused by these ice quakes um, and they're a source of these uh, being connected or correlating well with changes in air temperature would be one example of a non-traditional source. Um, another one might be looking at induced seismicity. So we might look at our earthquakes and we might address a content standard around the idea of uh, natural resources and uh, our demand for natural resources and how that influences um, uh, our geoscience, our uh, earth spheres um, based on our extraction of natural resources. So again, another activity that uh, students might wanna use in the classroom. And with that, I'm gonna stop uh, at this point. Um, we're about out of time and I know there's a couple of slides that, that uh, we want to show at the end um, for upcoming webinars and whatnot. But uh, if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or I'd also, of course, be able to um, answer them um, later as well. My email's on the screen. Uh, so please send me an email or uh, I look forward to meeting you at some point at NGSA, at the uh, NSTA meeting or other meetings. We do have a couple other questions. Um, sure. So first of all, one of the teachers was uh, interested in piloting earthquake locate and wonders if there's opportunity to do that. So perhaps you want to connect with, with them offline. I don't know. That would be great. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. And, and then um, an observation that when you were using that tool, there was a depth slider at the top, it looked mm -hmm. like. Yes. So yes. that's another way to, to be more precise in your location is to use that depth sl slider. And does it give you depth measurements then? It does. So okay. you can change the depth, depth estimate. So I was only focused on the sort of latitude and longitude adjustments just in that quick demo. But if you were to refine it even further, you could change the depth of that event because it really is a three-dimensional solution that you're after. And you can further increase your accuracy by um, adjusting that depth, by assuming certain depths. So again, the computer would be normally taking into account uh, depth factors as well. Okay, then there was one other question that I saw in the chat. Um, is there an easy way to get a three component seismogram from IRIS? <laughs> It's a great question. And unfortunately, right now, there is not one. Uh, the tool that we had uh, uh, isn't working right now. And so we don't have a really great way for the average citizen to get that data. Um, but that is something that we're working on repairing. And so we'd hope in the next six months, uh, if not sooner, to get that up and running again um, so that people can actually work on it. There are ways that you can get it easily if you're willing to go through um, some pretty tedious menus. Um, but if you want something for a lab activity, I'd be willing to help um, get that data for somebody who, who would really like it. So uh, you can Great. send me an email and I, I can, in the meantime, I can help plug the, plug the leak. Thanks. All right, do you want to run through the next couple of slides there? Sure. Um, we'd love to get to the one that has the link for the survey, but the, um, <clears throat> the post-webinar survey link is in the chat box. And we would really love for you to fill out that post-webinar survey. 
especially if you would like to have a certificate of webinar attendance, which you can now get after you fill out the survey. Um, so once you fill out that survey, you'll find a link there to another form where you can enter in your name and email address and you will be able to then receive our uh, post webinar um, attendance certificate. So we'd love for you to have that as well. Um, go ahead and move forward. And again, the link is in the chat box to get to that. Uh, this webinar series is brought to you by three organizations, and that is NAGT. You see the slide there, NAGT has a webinar about every week. So drop into the NAGT website and look for those webinars. Next one. Also the National Earth Science Teachers Association, NESTA. And you can see a link there to NESTA. The third organization, which I don't think we have a slide for right now, is the American Geosciences Institute. Look for some exciting announcements from AGI. And again, upcoming webinars registration is open for the uh, March webinar mini series, which will focus on questioning in the classroom. Two great webinars there. We hope to see you all on those webinars. And uh, go ahead and forward through to the last slide, I think. Or uh, one more, I think. We'll go to one more. If you'd like to reach That's out it. to any of us, to Ed Bobek, Carla McAuliffe, or myself, I think you'll find our contact information on the next slide, perhaps. If not, that's okay. Oh, and, that was uh, it. That's okay, we're, we're fine there. <laughs> okay. So if you wanna go back and view any of our archived webinars, you can view them at bit.ly forward slash webinar NGSS. At this point, I'd like to say thank you very much to Michael for, for joining us. Um, what a great bunch of resources and lots of new things for us to think about in terms of modernizing the way that we're teaching our students um, around all the resources that IRIS offers to us. So thank you very much, Michael, for, sure. for uh, presenting for us today. And we look forward to seeing everybody on another webinar in the future. Thanks for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Great, thank yeah, you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Of course, sure, my pleasure. Well, it was fantastic. As always. <laughs>